when we talk about deglobalization, which has been, or globalization, which has been constructed largely to create efficiency and better pricing of the global economy, as we move towards so a deglobal, arguably a deglobalization process, or perhaps even regionalized supply chains, this undoubtedly will result in less efficiency, uh, arguably more inflation, and higher cost um, to consumers. My argument then is, is as follows. Will, will these uh, temporary, maybe more permanent breakages in, um, in the symbiotic relations between companies and their supply chains, will this hamper innovation globally because of these breakages? Will this slow innovation and ultimately will it result in slower productivity of economies globally? So then, and lastly, uh, will this trend we're seeing, this de- or re-globalization, uh, will it entail a redistribution of the benefits of previous forces of globalization, i.e. away from China? And what does that particularly mean for this part of the world centered in the UAE in the Middle East? How do other regions, arguably Eastern Emerging Europe for Western Europe, Southeast Asia for Japan perhaps, Mexico for North America, how do other regions like the Middle East, not to mention Latin or Africa, start to rethink this new emerging de- or re-globalized world? That's the question. Janet, your headline thoughts on what is happening, is it de- is it re-globalization or is it something different? Uh I think, as you say, even before the pandemic, we were already in a world of elements of deglobalization. And now, as a consequence of the pandemic, we are going further down the deglobalization route. Um, but I would agree with the general premise um, of this panel that we are moving towards a multipolar world. And in terms of the implications of that, I think as you neatly summarized, um, a world of globalization was one for two or three decades where we had constant trade liberalization um, and we had um, free flow of labor uh, and huge cross-border efficiencies, particularly in the goods producing sector um, of the global economy. And you mentioned deflation. Um, I don't call that... Um, uh, to some degree, we had deflation, but in any ways, it was a good deflation. We know that there were distributional consequences from globalization. It benefited companies. Companies had a higher corporate profit share in GDP. It was bad for Western labor because you suddenly had this global labor market to some degree, but very good for Western consumers because they had this good deflation. They were able to buy many more goods um, globally, um, even against a world of low nominal wage growth. And as much as what we're seeing at the moment as a consequence of elements of deglobalization and the pandemic and shorter global supply chains, we've got the highest wage growth we've had in years in some of the more advanced economies, but the worst real wage growth we've had in several decades. So once again, there are already distributional consequences um, from um, the beginnings of the, these deglobalizing um, trends. And so when we think about the reversal of that, um, the deglobalization, you know, we could talk about the peace dividend, but maybe we'll park that for now. Um, governments now potentially spending more on, on defense spending rather than um, the, the, uh, what used to be called the peace dividend. There will be disruptions regarding capital flows. We, we, we were in a world of very free capital flow. Um, but also in terms of um, bringing it back you know, to the region um, and where this region, I think, could be a potential beneficiary even in this multipolar world is one in which um, it relates in many ways to, to services. Um, you know, when I think about, you mentioned the point about innovation. That is my fear that hand in hand with deglobalization, I do think deglobalization means lower growth, higher inflation. It is a worse trade-off. You know, deglobalization was stronger growth because of these efficiencies, lower inflation in a good way. It was a good deflation, even if there were distributional consequences. 
deglobalization means at least slightly higher inflation, slightly weaker growth, but it won't be just about goods. Um, it will be about services. And for me, a lot of where the innovation that we're going to see will come from, it will be in the service sector. Um, it won't be on goods. It will be in services. That's where I think we're going to see the productivity. But I'm sure we'll explore that conversation to a much larger degree. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, Roberta, coming to yourself, I want to pick up on this inflation and services and tough, opening, challenging question, if I may. The mega trend of our time is inflation. The opportunity, you say, Jenna, is services for a region such as GCC, Middle East. My observation is, if we think about our own lives the last 10, 20 years, we've seen deflation in tradables. Consumer goods are becoming cheaper, have become cheaper, and that's good for consumers, Maybe it's the China effect, and that has been a positive. China's been an exporter of deflation. But on tradables, services, they become significantly more inflationary. Think about our kids' education. Think about your insurance costs. Think about healthcare costs. Non-tradables, services are very expensive. How do, and that's sort of our lives, isn't it not? Inflation on services, deflation on tradables, consumer goods. What then, in light of what Janet said, what does this mean going forward? How does an economy start thinking about exporting services when there's such a strong, unbelievable potential for disruption in a positive way to reduce the cost of services which have traditionally been non-tradable? What do you think, Roberta? Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for that. Um, look, I'm much more of an optimist, so I think we are in a re-globalization phase uh, with some hiccups in the road. Um, if you look at what happened after the global financial crisis, balkanization of global capital, a few years on, 15 years on, global banks are as big, as powerful, as necessary as ever to provide financing flows, uh, which you wouldn't have to, uh, said after the first few reforms. Specifically in your question, um, I think that we've lived through two years which were very unusual. I think the position we're in now is uh, uh, not necessarily, I don't necessarily agree that services are higher. Yes, an Ivy League education has gone up, but anyone can make cross-border uh, payments to their families around the world for a tenth of what it was only five or six years ago. Okay. So I think that there's many services that technology, new economy, AI will give that actually will not be inflationary uh, in the service business. Uh, tokenization, uh, the insurance company is still very fragmented by desired regulation and lobbying. All of these things can be attacked in a new economy if governments give some kind of unified message and unified regulation, then the private sector can step in and make it uh, cheaper and more effective for consumers to operate in. I think if we look at where we are specifically here in the globalization versus, sorry, deglobalization or reglobalization argument, you know, there's winners and losers on the back of the pandemic. There's responses. Um, you know, we're in a part of the world in the UAE, which in my perspective has been a big, big net winner in the last few years, attracting talent because of reforms. Uh, you know, the way that they are, seem to be going on data, AI, attracting new technology, tourism, which is still very, very strong here. All these things, I, I think, point to a world where instances that might be protective for a time, for a certain reason, I think the trend is back towards more efficient uh, re-globalization. That's without even mentioning ESG and climate, which is clearly a global issue, and I think ultimately one where the leaders of the world will come together to create frameworks for the private sector to really push reforms forward that benefit uh, everyone, and that is really the ultimate re-globalization when we get to that. And I know that there's hiccups in that, and there's large new middle classes in emerging countries that want to pollute uh, n not by design, but just because of uh, their lifestyle changes. But I do think that technology and regulation will help the private sector, particularly because the investor demand for ESG compliant uh, investments and the exclusion of non-ESG compliant investment is such a hot topic. And I think that's a secular change uh, and that will push for globalization in that sphere. So I'm a little bit more positive about what we see coming ahead. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Tani, as Roberta mentions technology and regulation, you also said, Roberta, that UAE has been a net beneficiary in recent years of these sort of mega trends globally. Are you satisfied with how that 
being a net beneficiary? How is it, you know, if you look back the last 10 years, are you satisfied as a UAE? And what's coming next? How, do you, how are you thinking about these very impactful forces taking place in the global political economy? And what's the UAE thinking for the future? Are we satisfied? Absolutely no, because we're, we're, we're part of the globe. And we have to continue ensuring that we're attracting the best practices to the country and adding value to the global discussion. Going back to the main theme, are we in the era of deglobalizations or reglobalizations? I think we have to redefine the globalizations to ourselves because the pandemic in the last two years showed how, what, what, what does it mean to be alone and isolated from the rest of the world? And what does it, what does it uh, mean to be dependent on someone else? So if we're going to continue with the same, uh, raising the same questions, that's not going to take us anywhere. And we have to ensure that we are diversifying our relation and di diversify the way that we're running the, 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 the various economic sectors within our economies. If you look at the past 20 years, I don't think the issue is with the glo globalization. The main issue is the, with the multilateral systems. A multilateral uh, organizations are not being effectively utilized to serve the globalizations. Globalization has been adding prosperity and more understanding by movements, services, goods, people, brains, technologies from place to the, to the other. But what does it, what did the multilateral organization did in the last 20 years? Nothing, not that much. And they've been politically driven in their discussions and they haven't added a practical solutions to this, to, to, to our, to our uh, 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 sector. Looking at the UAE in the last two years, we have did major transformations because for us, the globalization, we're, it means that we're going to move from a regional hub to a global hub, and we're going to continue being, uh, doing so. Uh, basically because, first of all, tackling on uh, the, the comments, we're moving to our service sectors. That's absolutely right. Services are dominating most of the trades and trade volumes around the world. So looking at the States, looking at Europe, looking at even at China and the UAE, commodities are becoming less and less important as part of their uh, overall trade volumes. Same thing with the UAE, and that was what we're going to be dominating most of the discussions moving forward, especially when it comes to the finance, technology, brains, etc. But at the same time, we start seeing reshoring. Reshoring to the prime important commodities to, to the regions around us. But as, uh, at the same time, if we're thinking about the long-term industrial and manufacturing process, those needs uh, raw material, and the raw, raw, raw materials are very limited and owned by certain countries or certain companies around the world. So we have to ensure that there is a system, a governance uh, agreements to bring the raw materials for your own industrial and manufacturing. And at the same time, some of your uh, products from those manufacturing, for sure, they're going to have an added value on another industry built on. So no matter what we do, we have to live uh, uh, to, uh, and ensure that we're supporting and linked to each other. Otherwise, the whole system is going to collapse. Going back to the UAE and what we have done, we decided to open up our market by uh, going bilaterally on, on the comprehensive economic uh, partnership agreements. Looking at the numbers of free trade agreements from the Middle East and from Africa, we're having the lowest numbers globally. And this is not sustainable. And let's look at the best models globally. Indonesia, for example, in the last 10 years, they signed many more than tens of uh, free trade agreements. And they managed to double their economy. And they're becoming one of the top in economies globally. Are we going to continue waiting and defending our industries? Absolutely no. We want more inputs for our economies and we move on. And that's why we signed with India just last month. And we're about to conclude with Israel in the upcoming few days and the final touches with Indonesia. And we're going to continue. We announced the process with Turkey, with Pakistan, with Australia, and we're moving on. We're, we're planning to sign agreements which is going to give us access to 90% of the global trade in both services and, and commodities. 90%? 90% of the global trade. Wow. Well, that's the ultimate goal. We're going to move from being a regional hub to, to a global hub. The UAE historically has been known uh, as a trade destination, and we're going to continue evolving the system and bringing the legalities and system to the country uh, on that sphere. 
residency system has been revamped as well, so it can ensure the talents and the brains are, are uh, flows to the UAE, especially when it comes to digitalizations and the programmers. They're going to be the main transformer of the conventional sector. And we don't have that talent. Companies will not come here. We as uh, we and, and the conventional running of our business will not be able to transform. So that's why we're attracting coders to the country and we're building the capabilities uh, locally. Technologies, anyone who wants to apply the technology, they're welcome here. And we're going to open doors without applying the, the rigid laws that we'll have, what we're having. I was telling uh, my colleagues before the sessions, what we did in the last two years, yes, we continue with our policies and directions and strategies, but at the same time, we dig down into the bureaucracy. And we want to make sure that no matter how fast we're, we're moving, we don't want to create bureaucracies and, and, and uh, barriers within the system, which is going to be very complex in the near future. So that's why we're, we're working both horizontal and vertical manner to ensure we're breaking the, the doors and moving much quicker than before. Dr. Tani, just a question is that you, you, we see so many countries I visit and we hear about public policy focusing on industrial strategy. As Janice said about services, for you, is industrial strategy dead? Should countries be thinking about services strategy instead? We're very diverse, and this is the beauty of the UAE. We're having seven, seven emirates, and each, seven, each emirates, they're having their own strategy. If when it comes to industrial, we have a, an industrial strategy to take us from whatever the contribution now in, the, in, the, in the, our GDP, it's just around 4%, to almost 12% in the upcoming 10 years. So that is going to take us from 133 billion dirhams to 300 billion uh, dirhams in the upcoming 10 years. So we do have a dedicated strategies. Don't get me wrong, we want to ensure that we're expanding our industries and we want to make sure that the most important and crucial uh, prime products can, could be produced here and can be uh, as well be an input for another industries. We don't want to, fr to freeze that. But when it comes to services, services is very crucial in our, in our, uh, our economy and we're going to ensure it's going to be part of the next, next wave. Here we're talking about the hospitalities, logistics, aviations, uh, uh, the, the, the fintech financial technologies, and et cetera, et cetera. What is, has not been quantified uh, clearly is the re-export, and the re-export contributions on our GDP is around 3.5%. If we just double the volume mm. of re-export now, the contribution is going to be almost 12% in 10 years from now. And the, the impact of the re-export on the services is just a massive. So because it's the, the, the indirect value of the exports is usually coming into the, to the uh, financial technologies, the hospitality, the real estate, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And that is going to be announced as well very soon uh, by the cabinets. Uh, we, do, we do have a mix of those strategies. The diversity is very crucial. We don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. We don't want to say that we want to be industrial nations. No, we want to make sure that we are very diverse in our relations and in the way that we're running our sectors within the GDP. Coming back to yourself, thanks, Dr. Tani. Uh, coming back to yourself, Janet, is that one of China, as alluded to, is, is probably the most important country in terms of global supply chains. As we've talked about these forces of, of, of a, a new shape of globalization, there are existing, already existing forces in China that are supporting what Dr. Tani was talking about, diversification, be it industrial, be it even services, in other regions. Forces being demographic shifts in China and labor market. Forces being wage inflation, partly as a result of that, and loss of competitiveness. Forces, perhaps, of China's emphasis on state-owned companies and maybe resulting in sort of some, some non-tariff barriers or sanctions, perhaps, against China moving forward. That being so, is, is what is a, a changing China, perhaps even accelerated by current events, what does that mean for the global economy, really? And what does it mean for other regions, for example, like the Middle East? Well, I think it has short-term implications and longer-term implications. You know, what we're seeing um, at the moment, China's already changed its near-term policy focus. You know, previously it was about long-term growth um, and deleveraging and self-sufficiency in a large number of areas, both but now faced with um, growing concern about COVID um, and global growth risks um, in a world um, beset with renewed um, tensions, um, China itself is stimulating more on the policy front. So actually, China's demand for commodities is increasing at a time commodity price inflation is already um, underway. Um, but um, China is also um, investing 
quite heavily. But it's having to put on hold or, or indeed broaden the, the breadth of the stimulus away from what it considers to be its longer term priorities. It's all been about, uh, I suppose, putting being less reliant on the property sector and construction um, and being much more focused on higher end manufacturing and self-sufficiency and, 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 of course, having to accelerate its own self-sufficiency regarding chip supply and such like and, and green investment is obviously dramatically important. Um, but, but China, I think, still remains connected. And that's what I, I think, when, when we talk about deglobalization, it's almost as though people are perceiving that we're going back to a, a previous Cold War. We're not. We're going back to a multipolar sector. We know there are a lot of global challenges that we still have to face that might potentially be harder um, in a multipolar rather than a globalized world. Energy transition is, is one of them. And we know that that needs to be um, a priority. And, um, you know, we need to stay um, connected um, in that regard. But, but China um, is still undergoing productivity catch up. It still has a lot of growth potential. It still needs to be neglect, uh, connected with other parts of the world. It can't, it's, it's still reliant on exports to some degree. And it's still reliant on commodity supplies globally um, while it goes down the route of greater self-sufficiency in, in a number of areas. Um, so, you know, th there's a lot in the China story that we can um, continue to explore, um, but it is already, on any measure, the second most important economy in the world. And as we well know, for a lot of things, it's the largest and most important source and supplier of them. Yeah. Jen, you mentioned the phrase energy shift, energy transition. It's something that's occupying a lot of our day jobs at Deloitte currently. And uh, Roberta, coming to yourself, is that this whole entirely new energy value chain that is emerging yet to emerge, what does that mean for, um, big question, general global economy? What does it mean for countries that seek to capture a place or in this emerging energy shift, power shift um, new energy, if you will, value chain going forward? Well, I think it's um, a little bit, um, going back to what Janet said, it's a signal and noise thing, right? And right now the noise is so overpowering yeah. and it's hard to figure out what the long-term signal is. I mean, if we had blanked out the news of the last few weeks or maybe even the last few years and just listened to His Highness's comment, nobody would be any doubt that we're in a re-globalizing world where you have one government clearly looking how to best position itself uh, in that world. And I, I think that is really the signal. That's why I meant that I'm optimistic. So the energy uh, issue is uh, you can divide it into a few things, right? There's uh, trading opportunities for the large uh, commodity traders, banks, etc., and moving things around. There's near-term pain and gain for different companies or corporates that happen to be on the winning or losing side of it. But ultimately, it will just reset national security in companies will just include energy independence. So it's just a matter of money and resources and a multipolar world rather than a unipolar world. What risk does that mean and what do they need to do? I think that response for that is that we will see, again, going back to climate, that will bring it all together in terms of more energy efficiency. And that is a very globalizing uh, uh, pursuit for everyone to do. And technology, again, will be, I, I really think it will be borderless. It'll be very hard to have a very centralized approach to it. Um, and when you look at these two things together, I think that the risk of energy is less than I think the market thinks it is right now. But Dr. Tony, is that the last month, literally, how has the UAE, how has this region, considering oil and gas is so fundamental to the region's economy, what conversations have you been having as government governments in light of this seeming energy shock, if you will, positive or negative, over the course of the last month. And how has this changed or not fundamentally your economic strategies going forward? Most of the, most of the uh, discussion with the governments around the world is to ensure that there is enough supply of oil and gas, for sure. And at the same time, we have to continue the diversity of our uh, energy investments locally and internationally. Yes, we've been investing in renewables, but the gr green hydrogen is going to be a big portion of the, of the discussion moving forward. One of the main challenges which is facing everyone is the inflations and the prices. And we want to make sure that the, the movements of commodities 
globally is, is smooth and affordable to the to consumers. Otherwise, the impact on, on many of the uh, societies are going to be a disaster, and which is going to put pressure on the governments. The other big uh, matter is the investment in, in logistics. And now we're talking with many countries around, around us how we're going to be jointly investing in logistics. Let's look at the supply chain and let, let's look at the, the, the sector itself. There are so many inefficiencies in the sector, and it's one of the sectors which has not been disturbed for the last decades. So if we really want to bring the prices, which is now we're seeing globally a big issue, we have to ensure that we really rethink really about those crucial sectors, the conventional sectors, which we don't look at at all. We're thinking about the futuristic ones, but we're forgetting the ones which is going to continue being an important sector. So those being part of the discussion, especially with our neighbors. How that is affecting our uh, economic strategy, uh, it's aligned with the directions, openness, diversity, and we're not going to be depending on one, one group against other, and we're going to keep a good relation with everyone. And that was uh, announced during the Project of 50 uh, principles that even the politics are going to serve our economy, and we're going to continue exploring what are the opportunities that we have to do with the rest of the world. Especially in the last few days, we had so many ministers and so many, so many leaders. Yes, everyone is talking about the security and stability of the region. But at the same time, the, the security and stability are always linked to the economy. If you, don't, if you do have a very strong economy, it means the security and stability are going to be much stronger. So we have to make sure that things are going hand in hand uh, moving forward. Thank you very much for your, for your, for your presence and your participation, um, not just our speakers. Thank you very, very much, and all of you here as well. Thank you for attending. I fully realize how, how um, collectively valuable your time is. On behalf of myself and Deloitte, um, much appreciated, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.